Our next speaker is uh, Kevin Heatley. Kevin is a senior scientist with Biohabitats and a tech consultant to, responsible, uh, to the Responsible Drilling, Drilling Alliance in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. As a restoration ecologist, Mr. Heatley works on initiating or accelerating the recovery of ecosystems whose health, integrity, and sustainability have been degraded, damaged, or destroyed as a result of human activity. While he works on a national basis, Kevin lives in the woods of northern PA and has direct experience uh, with the impacts of natural gas. Marcellus Shale natural gas development has significantly impacted the integrity of the forest, water, soil, air quality, and recreational use of our public land, a particularly important topic given the weak protections afforded New York's public land in the release, recently released uh, EIC. So please welcome Kevin Heatley. My name is Kevin Heatley, and uh, I'm a, what they call a restoration ecologist. Uh, I'm not a, a researcher. I don't work in academia. I'm a practitioner. I'm out in the field actually getting things done and trying to figure out how can we restore some of these systems that have been degraded. So I have a unique perspective on this Marcellus stuff. Uh, I also live in north central PA, and I'm watching my homeland disappear. And Tom Corbett is your best friend, because if he keeps the gas industry in PA, you're in good shape. All right, uh, next. Now that worked. Um, this is my place here. This is why I'm here. This is why I drove two hours up here. Uh, it's great scenery. It's terrific. But uh, I don't have any family or friends up here. Well, I have new friends. But that, hey, I didn't say next. <laughs> I knew this system wasn't going to work. OK, there's my place. That's what I'm here to protect. And that's my, my, my one son here. The other one's in college. I'd be out of Pennsylvania. I'd be off the shale anywhere in the United States, any of these shale plays. He's 12 years old. This is the only home he's ever known. This is where he wants to stay. This is where his memories and his, this is his homeland. And the only reason I'm here tonight and why I'm helping people from Ireland and people from South Africa and the, and the crazy hippies at the RDA is because, I'm so, oh, that's on tape. No, they're good guys. <laughs> the only reason I'm helping everybody is because of that. I'd be gone in a minute. Because what they're going to do and what they're doing around me is just incredible. I can't believe it's the 21st century. This is 19th century economic model, and it's, it's, it's a disaster. Next. Okay, so first I'm going to start off with a little saga, a little warning, a little Louisiana. Because this is where these guys learn their chops, and this is where they're coming from. I did a project last year down in Louisiana, and this is the modality. This is what they're thinking. This is how they approach the landscape. Don't buy any of that nonsense about they're going to be sensitive, they're going to, they're going to do this, and you can regulate it. I'm going to talk about something you can't regulate. Now, the, everybody gets hung up on the hydrofracking and the chemicals, and it's very valid. The air pollution, all these kind of things are valid things. But the industry will come back at you with, well, we can use this new technology. We can use non-toxic fracking material. We can uh, recapture the volatile organics out of the atmosphere. We can do all these great things to make it more benign. Well, I'm going to tell you about something they cannot mitigate. They cannot mitigate the impact of a dispersed industrialization across the landscape. That is inherent in the industry. You are going to see industrial sites everywhere, everywhere. Every mile, it's not so, they're every mile apart. It's, you saw those pictures of the Allegheny. You are going to see these wherever they find it profitable to put them. So nowhere is safe. If there, was, if there was an economic fossil fuel return out of the heads of Mount Rushmore, every one of those, every one of those would have rhinoplasty tomorrow. They'd be done. There is nothing sacred. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding on this. So I'm going to give you an example down in Louisiana, just to give you an idea of what they do. Um, I can't see everything I have in there, but this is, this, is the, this is the delta in Louisiana, south of New Orleans. Next. Okay, I don't know how much you know about Louisiana. Don't put it on your life list, but it's a, it's a, there, New Orleans is a neat place. I shouldn't say that. But Louisiana has lost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of wetlands over the last few decades, and 50, 60 years. It's just amazing. I know people down there that I work with, and they, they are the same age as I am, the same age as Audrey from uh, Aubrey, or whatever his name is, from the CEO of Chesapeake. Talk about an extremist. Have you seen his income? That's extreme. Anyway, these guys that are the same age as me, they can see what's happened to their homeland. The places that were dry land are gone. Next. So what caused that? 
Now, they'll tell you on the news, they'll say, well, the, the Army Corps engineers dike the, the Mississippi. That's very bad. That's true. New Orleans is in the wrong place. It's in a shallow basin. It's bound to get flooded. That's true. They never tell you about what the oil and gas industry did. Very rarely will you hear about the oil and gas industry. These guys cut oil and ac uh, ga access canals through this delta. They cut 10,000 of these, 10,000 miles of access canals. And what you'll see in this picture is looking down one of the canals on either side, you see that forest. That's not what it's supposed to look like. Those are elevated mounds. All the soil was taken out and thrown on either side, and that's all the stuff that's grown on that. Oh, that looks great. No problem. Next slide. Big problem. The delta is supposed to deposit all that Mississippi mud. That creates the wetlands. That creates the buffer for storms. So what happens when you channelize it with 10,000 miles of canals, and you go ahead and you put all this dirt on either side of it? Well, you disrupt the hydrology. Now the water doesn't sheet flow across the surface. You change the uh, dissolved oxygen levels. You, the, the amount of oxygen in those canals drops way down. A lot of species don't like that. Changes the kind of composition of the, the fish community and all the other associated biota. You facilitate invasive species incursions. All that elevated mound, those are up five feet, sometimes 10 feet high on the sides. You've got the perfect substrate for a number of different invasive species. Number one is something called Chinese tallow tree. And you just get that everywhere, which displaces, again, all the native vegetation, native flora, and fauna. You get saltwater intrusion. So salt water starts moving up these canals. So you, you get the idea. You get this, everything's connected in a spider web. You probably remember that from high school biology when they had like half a page on ecology. You, you tweak a little bit on that spider web. What the hell happened over here? I didn't expect that to happen. You get increased storm surges. The wetlands start to disappear. They start to wash away. And then when that hurricane comes in, you're in big trouble. And those people that died in Katrina are direct subsidies to fossil fuel industry. That is a given. Those people died because of this stupidity. So let's look at the positive side. You'll see a little, uh, you'll see a little, uh, well, little. It's a, a floating excavator there. We call them marsh buggies down there. They call them marsh buggies. All right, so we got a project to restore these, some of these canals. Next. We degrade it. We throw the dirt and the trees and all the junk back in the canal. It's not rocket science, but it works. Next slide. So we were able to fix some of these systems somewhat, not completely. You can't fill in the canal because once you take thousands of years worth of organic material and put it up in the air, it starts to oxidize and breaks down and dissolves and you don't have as much volume to put back in the canal. So the canals are still there, but at least you know, the, the level of the topography is the same. Now water can wash back and forth. Now the invasives can't get a, a foothold. But guess who paid for that? You did and you did and you did. Everybody in this room paid for this. This is federal money. This was our money that was spent. The natural gas and the oil industries did not pay for this at all. And they're not going to pay for any of the damage they're going to do to the landscape here because there are no funds. They've got, they've got exemptions from Superfund. They don't care. This is obvious they don't care. They did this over 60, 70 years ago. 60 to 70 years they've they accumulated damage. 10,000 miles of canals in Louisiana. Oh, well, Louisiana, you know, we're helping the e economy. 13% of the jobs in Louisiana, according to the American Petroleum Institute, are associated with oil and gas. Louisiana is number two or three in poverty in the United States. And this is after 60 or 70 years of these idiots. Oh, that's going to be on tape. That's a little harsh. Uh, sorry, Chesapeake. But this is the truth. You got that one of the poorest states in the country, and yet it's, number, it's, it's the, in the top four for oil and gas production. What does that tell you about the impact on your communities, on your state? Don't buy the, uh, the jobs. That, it, that's ridiculous. So that's what they're going to do. And we did five miles of canals, and it cost about $1.3 million dollars and there's 10,000 miles. Is it going to get fixed, or are more people going to get killed? Next slide. So let's jump over to uh, something that's more, maybe you have a better feel for, which is the, the landscape and the, and the forest systems that make north central PA and, and the southern tier a unique place to live. 
I mean, there's a, there's a reason I live out here, and it's not because, or in Pennsylvania, in northern PA, it's not because of the great cultural amenities. It's because of this, because of the landscape. Next slide. And the next slide. And let's do one more. Oh, there, there's your beautiful landscape. Let's, that's going to be a calendar someday. I can't wait. All right, next slide. And they start off with this. They start off with the seismic surveys. And the reason I throw these guys up here, I don't know these guys individually. These are not the same company that showed up on my doorstep, trespassed on my land, unleashed, and cut down my brush, and saw my signs, and didn't run the flagging through my property. But when I saw the helicopter, chick, 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 every day for two weeks, hovering over a point on my woods, and I went up there, I found they put a little bit of flagging on the tree and cut the... You cannot trust these people. Absolutely cannot trust them. In Pennsylvania, they're supposed to say 300 foot. I don't know if it's a national reg or whether it's just state, but 300 foot from a well or a structure. Did they ever ask me? Now, they weren't supposed to be on my land in the first place, but they put charges right up to the property line. Did they ever ask me where my well was? I had to call my DEP to protect me, my Department of Environmental Protection. And they come out with a handheld Garmin unit. Handheld, the kind you go at Gander Mountain and you get to mark your favorite hunting stand so you can find it next year. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, they, don't, they do not care. You cannot trust them. It's obvious you can't trust them from what they've done other places, from what they've done with leasing and how they try to fleece people. And then when they get out there, you are just in the way. If you say no, you are not going to get a nice reaction. Next slide. That's a, little, that's a little personal story to bring some personal interest to it. So let's get into a little bit of the ecology, because apparently that's what they think I am, an expert. So we've got see in the forest for the trees, okay? Well, well people like, they, they think, okay, the trees will grow back, you know, the, we won't cut a lot of trees, blah, blah, blah. And, jeez, uh, the last presentation did a real good job on, those, on the fragmentation, but if you look at what the forest does, the forest as a whole, the forest appreciates in value over time. It is a legacy from our grandparents. It's something that the longer you don't screw it up, the more valuable it becomes. And in our region of the country, I travel all along, around the United States, we have a unique asset because we have a significant block of unbroken contiguous forest. Oh sure, there's, there's farms and there's roads and there's there's people living in the forest, but for the most part, it's contiguous, and that is its primary asset. It's not the trees themselves. It's the, con the contiguous nature of this forest, what we would call core forest. And what is core forest? Forest that's next to forest, as opposed to forest that's next to non-forest. So you go down in Maryland, and they have their Forest Protection Act, and all it turns out to be is little buffers between Walmart and the development. That's not a viable forest. In fact, most of those forests are not regenerating at all. They save a lot of tree cover, but they're not saving the forest. Sustainable benefits. The forest is sustainable. It will supply an economic return for your communities for generations. Down in Pennsylvania, it's estimated 90,000 jobs are associated with the forest and the forest industry. And there's a difference, again, I just covered this, core forest and woodlots. Okay, and if you let the fragmentation, this is where fragmentation is important. The more fragmentation, you change what that forest is and what it will be. You change it ir pretty much ir uh, irreparably. It's going to take generations. When they go in there and they shred it and dice it, it'll take centuries to repair. Next slide. So here's the short list. And, and like I said, I'm not going to teach you ecology in half an hour. But there are a whole host of things, and I don't even remember them because I can't see them now. But that gives you an idea. There's a whole host of impacts associated with what happens when you go into the forest. Now, one thing I do want you to remember is that although the pads are only five or now eight or maybe 20 acres, everything's got to be connected by a road. Everything's got to be connected by a pipeline right away. So now we're multiplying the, the direct in, uh, footprint. But those footprints extend farther into the woods. In other words, just because they didn't cut this tree on the edge of the pad doesn't mean it's not affecting the forest health way into that forest. And typically in conservation biology, when we're looking at preserving species, preserving the functioning of a forest system, 
And what's a core forest? We want to have a buffer of at least, a rule of thumb, at least 100 meters, 300 feet. And it depends on the species that you're trying to preserve. So grizzly bears, you've got to have more than 300 feet to keep your grizzly bear population viable. But for certain other critters and salamanders and different plants and, and neotropical migrant birds and those kind of things, 300 foot. So I mean, right there, you're going to have those impacts going into that and degrading way into that buffer zone. Next slide. The Nature Conservancy down in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania chapter, did a great study that was released last November, and I don't know why it's not thrown all over the place, but I guess the people in the Nature Conservancy don't have the high testosterone, New Jersey attitude that I have. But this is a great study. They spent a lot of man hours on this. They did what's called a spatial analysis. They looked at the landscape. They looked at a bunch of different variables as to what they could think of that seems to be guiding these decisions by the oil and gas industry. Now, we all know the main decision variable is money, but how do they decide where they put these things? So they looked at proximity to roads and other infrastructure, pipeline proximity, blah, blah, blah. So they looked at a bunch of different variables. They come up with they're anticipating Conservative estimate, about 60,000 wells in Pennsylvania. Now, the industry actually goes beyond that. If you look at what they give their official, how they're going to distribute these things, two-thirds the Nature Conservancy is estimating. Two-thirds of them are going to go into forested habitat. Now, we're 100-plus years since the logging disaster that now, if you go down to Williamsport, they celebrate as the lumber capital of the United States. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. The, the streams were brown, the trout were gone. It took 100 years recovery. So we're doing the same thing over again. We're shredding it. We're shredding it. We're going to lose all those ecosystem, not lose them, we're going to degrade those ecosystem benefits. The, the water quality, the air quality, the recreation. And, and what's fundamental to me is the sense of place. What makes the southern tier the southern tier? You don't have skyscrapers. skyscrapers. Do you want them? You don't have Walmart in every corner. You don't have a Starbucks around every bend. Do you want it? Because then you'll be anywhere USA. This is what makes this region unique. Next. So that's what they're going to do. And you've seen a couple of slides of this already. And I'm seeing this where I raise my sons, where I introduce them to hiking and fishing and, and, and introduce them to the woods. You can't go in these places now. They've destroyed them, and they're destroying them every day, and it's incredible. And they'll do it to you, and they don't care. Next. The right, it's, it's all got to be connected. You've got to remember that. You are going to be living in the midst of a grid, an industrial grid. You are going to be superimposed on an industrial grid. The industrial grid is going to come first because the money comes first. Like they say, water flows uphill towards money, and that's what's happening. When you see these people, and Sandra was talking about this before, and I heard about this before too, down in Texas where they're having the drought, they're still fracking wells with water, even though people don't have any water to feed their cattle. They're fracking wells. They're going to take precedence. Your surface rights are secondary. Next. So the woods, Penn's Woods, becomes Penn's woods lot, Woodlots. Uh, not applicable to New York State, but you get the idea. Next. Massive surface impacts. And I mean, I could go into this, but I've only got a half hour. There's a multiplicity of impacts. When you have an edge, an edge forest is different from a core forest. Not just, and I'm not talking about birds and bunnies and butterflies. I don't have any patience for that. I don't have any patience for all that warm and fuzzy new age nonsense. And I probably lost half my audience already. I, I'm talking about quantifiable, scientifically validated impacts that we know are going to happen that have economic consequences for what we can get from the forest as a society, as to how sustainable, how much we're going to put into that, how we're going to get those benefits, that clean water. Even if you don't, if, if you don't care about anything about uh, the warm and fuzzies, if you don't care if Bambi gets his head blown off, you, you don't care about any of that stuff. But you value those benefits and you don't want to have to pay extra for them, that forest is important. Next. The industry will say, we'll fix it. We'll fix it. We'll reclaim it. We're going to reclaim the land. What they're going to do, they're going to plant grass. Your forest is gone. And they're going to come back and they're going to refract these wells and they're going to scrape it clear, clear again and they're going to refract every two to three years until the production, they can't get any production. Then they're going to put another pad somewhere else close by. 
The, the one thing I want to take home also, besides that, you know, that this is inherently incompatible with sustainable land use, is that reclamation is not restoration. You either surrender the forest or stop them because you cannot have both. The forest is gone. You will have woodlots in between wells and pipelines and roads. And that's, that's the God's honest truth. Next. You know, if you are into the warm and fuzzies, there's a couple of interior forest species that'll be in looking for a place to nest and they won't be able to find some good spots. Next. Brook trout. I'm sure there's a couple of trout fishermen in here and this really kills me. There's a, there's a, there's a young lady in the audience tonight that we took out to see um, where in the little Muncie Creek, seven miles from my house, a trout stream that I've fished before, Bubbling methane coming up. I wish I could have put the video on here, but I would have run out of time. I'm probably going to run out of time anyway. But the bubbling methane coming out of the creek. I mean, whoa, I didn't say next. I knew this system was faulty. Do you work for Chesapeake? <laughs> so this, this brook trout, the Nature Conservancy is estimating that in Pennsylvania, 80% of these wells, the new Marcel, 80, I'm sorry, not 80% of the wells, 80% of the watersheds that now house, that are intact, and these are basically headwater systems up in the forest, they're gonna see well development. If you screw up with a surfactant spill or you dump silt in there and you mess up that population of brook trout, they ain't coming back unless somebody puts them back because they're not gonna be able to migrate up to that spot again because we've disrupted everything in terms of the connectivity and the populations. Those are isolated populations. They're gonna be what's called extirpated. They're gonna be locally extinct. And 80%, I mean, well, are you crazy? Who's, who's making these decisions? Next. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up real quick here with the invasive species, because this is, this is a primary focus of what I do a lot of around the United States, is invasive species management. Invasive species, for those who aren't familiar with it, they probably, you've probably heard of the hemlock woolly adelgid. You've probably heard of uh, emerald ash borer. These are organisms that don't come from North America, uh, and our native species don't have a lot of ability to combat them. In other words, they're out of their native habitat. They don't have their native um, herbivores or native uh, pathogens. Their populations explode and they just, they go uh, crazy over the ecosystem and they end up everywhere. Dandelions, perfect example. You can't get dandelions, they grow anywhere. This is a, a plant, a Japanese stilt grass. Um, Invasive species estimate. I think it's Cornell study, actually. Cornell, I, I tell you, I am, I would do it here, but I'd probably get the fire marshal on me. I will burn my master's degree from Penn State. Penn State is a joke. Thank God for Cornell, because Cornell actually is bringing up information. And of course, Ithaca College, correct? Right? I don't want to forget Ithaca College. But Penn State? Uh, I'm not going to say anything bad on tape. Next slide. Oh, $120 billion a year, that's what I was going to say. $120 billion a year is the, uh, the estimate that's typically floated around a Cornell study. Um, Japanese stilt grass, I don't know if you're familiar with this, anybody that has a rural property, but this is an annual plant that's just a nightmare. And I spent most of uh, yesterday on my own place trying to control Japanese stilt grass before it goes to seed, because if you let it go, it, the next year you have more of it, and the seeds last for about seven years. All you need is to spread this by mowing at the wrong time or running your tires over it and moving the dirt with the seeds, and it'll, it'll not only take root where it's there, but it'll spread gradually into the forest. And I see this all the time in my work. I, I've dealt with this, and it's just amazing to see. If there's a, a, a flood, it just carries the seeds right into the forest understory. Next slide. Japanese knotweed. You may have seen these along some of your waterways. Uh, Japanese knotweed is another one that'll just create what they call a monoculture. You just have a dense stand of what looks like bamboo and you can't get through it and all your native plants are gone. So what is the recipe for this kind of biological invasion? Uh, you have to have the organism, you have to have some kind of disturbance so it can get established over the native plants, you have to have a transport mechanism, which, you know, frack trucks, you're going to the river, up the mountain, to the river, up the mountain, to the river, up the mountain. And do you think these guys are neurosurgeons that are washing up after every fill? 
what this mechanism would be is the perfect transport mechanism. So you put a big cup of stupidity on top of that, and you are going to have biological invasions like you wouldn't believe. Your forest systems are going to change. And what, who cares about that, right? Who cares? Well, you're not going to have the same tree regeneration. You're going to lose the economic value. And then if you're a private landowner and you happen to be adjacent to the Allegheny or wherever, that is just going to migrate onto your property, and you are going to pay the cost, or the future landowner is going to pay the cost for suppression. And it's not going to come from the industry because they have no biosecurity measures at all. It's not even on the table. It's not even discussed because these are not rocket scientists. These are geomorphologists. Well, I guess it's pretty close to a rocket science. But these are not ecologists, and these are not sustainability experts, or they would not be in fossil fuels. Next slide. So who's going to pay for this? Hint, just like in Louisiana, you are or your children are, or your grandchildren are. Because what we're doing with this industry is we're privatizing profits and socializing costs. And if the true externality costs, the true cost of business would put in there, this stuff would not be economical. Next slide. So there's the take home message. It's incompatible with a sustainable landscape. Next slide. So, I mean, there, there, is no there is no regulation that you can control this. This is inherent in the industry. And this is what I, wanna, I really want to emphasize. The industry is going to come back with, we can control the air pollution. We can use better chemicals. We can be careful that we don't use too much water. They cannot avoid industrializing your landscape and destroying the central aspect of what makes your community have a sense of place. That will be gone. Next. So, there, you know, there's a, there's a parting shot of my hero, Aldo Leopold, and what, you know, what he would say about something like this. And the next final slide is just a uh, photo credits and uh, the Responsible Drilling Alliance. And, and I'd recommend anybody that has an ounce of concern, you've got to raise your voice in unison. Because the only thing we have to combat money is numbers, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing like bringing up a Jersey boy to shake things up, I guess, huh? Um, 